James? Uh, yeah, so uh, UCL, one of the things we're trying to do is put together a complete syllabus in the learning what you need to know in order to contribute to a traditionally based PhD to as many students as possible that need it through through the MRES here at Public Training Centres and that's uh, So uh, we're doing some accountancy and what's up here, but we're also doing follow on in the country, uh, back and programming course, uh, there's uh, five sessions of three hours, then a longer recent software engineering and Python course, that's ten sessions of three hours, uh, which goes into software engineering and stuff, and then follow up from that one to term one, then term two, another uh, ten sessions of three hours course on, uh, uh, which is research performance in plus, which is also going into the PC that stuff and, and, and that kind of thing. So really trying to um, do uh, to get a, a, a line of what the people are doing um, competition based PhDs um, through a complete syllabus and, and, and research research programs so. and so that's one thing uh, I'm interested in I'm also in the training context also interested in the technologies we use for, for making robust reliable training materials in Computational subjects, so it's completely impossible to write a technical core lecture if you read code where the code is correct. If you just type it in and then don't execute it, it will be wrong. So we need to use literal programming approaches to, to, to generate the materials. So that's quite interesting. Um, and the other thing that's interesting and worry about quite a bit is we're all people putting effort a lot in terms of training materials. The company does a great job of creating like standard set of stuff. Uh, we can all start from, but also training is quite personal and different structures at different styles. You do want to adapt things to be to the particular teaching style, and somehow we need a way to kind of put, uh, mix things together. Um, so that, like, I can say from software carpentry, import these few lines, and then do this bit, and then from that, and so a from import type thing for teaching materials would be completely awesome, but we don't have one. Um, so, again, those are some things. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think I can go into the questions from our audience about training. So, um, yes, uh, courses that you're going to do, but they are available. Yeah, CC by um, online, uh, get the um Some will probably stick to the Slack. Um, uh, so, uh, the way it works is there's a GitHub repo that can take. Clubs for the Python courses or uh, mark out and practice for C plus code and C plus courses, uh, and then that gets rendered into HTML and uh, it gets rendered into slides using uh, Leo.js and it gets rendered into a PDF using MD Convert and then that gets squirted onto the web with a piece of creation build. So basically, you can make a change to the notebook.
Alexa, could you use my microphone? Data carpentry has uh, the idea of data carpentry is that materials are adopted to different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Materials are still in development, so there's quite a lot of work ahead. Um, and they are pitched at, at a lower level, so that people who don't have any programming background. So I guess that is sort of a free step that might help. Uh, but yeah, what, what I think what you were saying also about the fact that you based your, your courses on so much carpentry is the fact that the carpentry does not differentiate. Disciplines, really, you know, it's, it's, it's a set curriculum, and the examples are uh, fairly generic. Uh, the data purpose aims to have examples for disciplines. But I guess, yeah, at the level that uh, you're, you're teaching the courses, they do think that um, examples are not the main. Uh, I mean, this is not the key, it's more about the skill of teaching. Yeah, I mean, so it's it's a, it's a it's right? You would get better learning outcomes if you had examples that were specific to every student. But you also have a better, a better results, and possibly you could argue, and I think this makes sense for software like carpentry, working on one set of materials repeatedly and refining it, you improve it more. So software carpentry gains would back by having uh, one set of materials, maybe, uh, because then everyone, more people are focused on one thing, uh, but it loses from the fact that it's such a thing, maybe. So yeah, what, that's one thing that, that comes up a lot with software carpentry is that we focus on a small number of opinionated lessons. And when we run a workshop, we say that you have to be using some number of our lessons, at least three of our core lessons, and your instructors should be trained through, through our approach. If you are calling the workshop a software carpentry. That being said, the materials are online and anyone can use them to learn from the self learner, to teach from, whatever they want to, but the brand software carpentry is really about us coming to help build local capacity at institutions of instructor training and delivering short, impactful workshops. So we really focus on that short, impactful two-day workshops is what we try to focus on. And out of that, out of that constraint of two days, what you're doing in that two days is you're not giving out to people all the skills they possibly need, but you're trying to build the best mental model of Foundation for their future learning. And that's something we need to, that I was saying we need to do a lot more support of. And it happens very organically in those places where the future learning is based on support groups and communities and hacky hours and different activities that, that come afterwards. Um, and so that, that that's what our focus is. And we acknowledge that people are going to do lots and lots of different approaches, and we encourage that. We want Share that with our right? So it's a community that is you know, opinionated about these lessons, focusing on short two days, and um, building a local community up about these lessons and how to teach them. Within, within institutions as well, software carpentry is a really important thing of being an anchor to get you know, as a way of reaching out to people because it's got some, some reputation now. Uh, people often have their first contact with, uh, with what we're doing from a community building point. Yeah, so we, we're also trying to just get people who are programming PhD students and postdocs from different fields to talk to each other because the people have a lot in common in completely unrelated fields, right? And one of my favorite examples was the conversation between uh, two people doing individual based modeling, one with ships moving around the world economy, and one with cells uh, moving towards cancer, right? And but the modeling paradigms are the same, so they and they and we, all without what we do in terms of trying to get students to talk to each other and these things, that comes to what happens. But software carpentry is, is a great kind of first point of contact with people to the then wider ecosystem of, of work on in, in the university on, on, uh, on software, on pro research programs. Like this, I didn't want to ask a question. So, yes. Yeah, so you mentioned the different formats. I'd be interested to hear you know, how, what you think about the kind of structure that the lesson is from your experience, what works, what doesn't. I know software carpentry is trying to kind of really break up, you know, systems and find out what's going on. You know, it's going to be other tips for how to run, you know, practically run the session. Oh, our instructor training goes deep into that. So, Alexander, being an instructor trainer, I'll let you. Yeah, so can you, sorry, can you rephrase this? I have heard your question. Sorry. Just uh, practical tips for actually running training sessions. So, when you've got a group of students, 
was in the best place to form as it is. You know, is it best to have it? So I think, and it was mentioned earlier, the main problem is you usually have like a really wide spectrum of prerequisite knowledge that people come with. And so people at the beginning are really bored and they switch off. They do that thing where they look up a second later and they're lost. You know, or yeah. Yeah. So um, that's, I think that that is a problem that's never going to be fully addressed to the spectrum because remember that uh, people you get to these workshops, that's that's going to remain like this, are people at least at postgraduate level. So they've been through lots of different levels of education, they have different backgrounds, it's always going to happen. And uh, you know, pre-workshop assessments, no matter how they are, they're always, they're, they're never perfect. So, so you have to first of all accept that. Uh, I guess managing expectations, so um, if you advertise the workshop correctly, so you want to pitch a workshop at the beginners, make sure that it's in the advertisement. People who are more advanced sign up, maybe they, they feel they want to, you know, learn something more in depth, but they, they feel they're advanced, but actually they're missing some knowledge. And also, you know, if you advertise correctly, they can't really complain badly to you. Uh, and when you open the workshop, that's what I do. And so I pitch the workshop to beginners, I won't say it clearly at the open. I pitch it and we advertise it to people who understand the basic programming concepts who will mention this. Um, if possible, if it's feasible, uh, we encourage peer programming. So if you can uh, identify people who are more advanced, those who are really struggling, and pair them together. And uh, if everything is hands-on, we also give them exercise, encourage them to work together and make sure that the person who is the novice is actually the so-called driver, so they're in charge of the keyboard. And the person more advanced is, is the navigator, so is, is, is giving them the information, is talking them through. Um, a lot of people who are more advanced discover that actually explaining things to, to novices, they learn much more. Uh, another thing is have a set of uh, exercises or small tasks, which uh, you know, have a range of complete this task, and as additional features you can try to develop this, or you know, uh, make turn it into one function rather than like two functions, or make it this look more efficient. You can have these extra sort of uh, things around these tasks and exercises to keep the more advanced students um, busy uh, and not getting bored. If you have somebody who's really advanced uh, and you can see that they're quite keen, that they're somebody who, who would really work well as a helper, they turn them into a helper. So, so really get them engaged into, into a workshop. Um, and yeah, all these tips and tricks tips and tricks are uh, part of the instructor training and the whole material for the instructor training is online available just like any other material. So it's, it's available for the software projects. One other thing that we do um, that isn't always apparent but it's super important is we make sure that all three major platforms we have an environment that we can install on the learner's own laptop that they bring to the workshop. And that is so hugely important and empowering to send someone out of the room with all of the tools, knowing that they can use it. We, we've had a long discussion over the years in, in the community about why don't we just give people a VM? A VM doesn't give them, a virtual machine doesn't give them that same feeling of empowerment that they are in control of their own destiny in terms of processing data. So um, you know, there are still instructors that choose these VMs, there are um, instructional that have big cloud systems that their management tells them you have to you know, make use of this cloud and get more users on the cloud and so software company is a gateway for that. Um, but you know, the, there's a lot of work that goes into the community and if you ever develop your own lesson and you want it supported by our community, you'll have to think about how that tool is to get on every major platform. In the community though, we do need more people who are Useful research uh, fans, but are Windows natives by uh, background to help us improve that side of the materials. We know that we, we mostly come from Mac and Linux, both in our instincts and the where we come from, and therefore I always feel that the Windows stuff is, is experience is less satisfactory. So, and there are people who are Windows natives by background and inclination, but still have all the right useful research beliefs and instincts, and we need those in the community really lots. Add to what James said that because I get this question so why is the materials for let's say Windows partial are not there for people who think it's not this is not worth the development no it's because most of the people contributing the materials do not use Windows yeah. and they don't know how to develop it. So you know people yourselves can do it. Yeah. We need to do. 
Uh, one question, we will say that. You, yes, you. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So I really wish we had that. We, the problems include um, different instructors write training in different platforms. Some people use, you know, Prezi or Reveal. Some people use uh, PowerPoints and, and things. So the mixing those things together is so there's a lot of software work we need to do in order to get the from your training in for these lessons thing. For stuff. The other thing is I don't think it's the actual writing of the materials where the scaling problem is. It, the, the really blocking steps, the marshalling and organising of it, right? Um, just getting, you know, <coughs> you know, even if those ins instructions exist, to discover, you know, lots of different things. The discoverability problem becomes hard and stuff. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I do think that some of the core IT problems are, are, are solvable. But we just haven't done it. So, I just going back to the question that Alexander raised at the beginning. It's uh, how we can build a good network of here in the UK and with uh, the software that we got into the community as a global community. Uh, so, from other answers, I think that it's important to support from those users, even if most of the people that work with us are Mac and Linux users, uh, and try to make it easy for people to send contributions back to their lessons. So, uh, any more comments about what you view with this local and global community? Yeah, well, I mean, it really starts with, with running workshops locally and then having the experience of those workshops locally. You know, when I, you know, I come out of the community as an instructor and I basically toss off a carpentry because it helped me have higher level conversations with the people who were coming to so for me, I said, okay, you, you know, I want you to be able to own your own problems and solve your own, your own research questions using software and computational tools. Come to, take us up three days, come to this workshop, and then let's build a conversation based on the skills and the mental framework that you build in, in this workshop. So I think a lot of the capacity building at the local level is around the workshops and the support structure after the workshops. At the regional level, it's, um, there, there's a, Narrative um, kind of going on with the RSEs here. Um, I think there's a, a thing back there which is speed dating for RSEs. We do a lot of um, online meetings in the software carpentry community where people start to get to know each other. We have a mentorship community that's very active. Um, we have folks all at every time zone in the world who can't ever find time to meet, so they have to meet twice each day um, once in the morning. Australia, New Zealanders, and South Africans, and you know, there's, we, we're, we're trying to, to create an inclusive community where people have opportunities to get together and talk about the future of how do we develop new instructors, how do we support them as they go to teach during the first workshop, um, and all that. So that, that's the, the international level. In the middle, I think building opportunities and this network of people, uh, this, this part of SSI, is a great way to have both the what your mandate is in terms of what you do for software sustainability, plus instructor training to really share those tips and stories about instruction. So I think at all of those scales, the workshop level, the instructors, opportunities for instructors to meet each other at different events, you know, birds of a feather, or different hangout kind of events at, 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 at major meetups, and then internationally participating as you can in a lot of these subcommittees and task forces. Task force. I think the, the, the difficulty sometimes we and Giacomo seem to be 
Jack or are you back in the room? Yeah. Yeah. So Jack wants that this way, and I guess if you're gonna you're gonna support that is that uh, there are pockets of instructors around the UK. Uh, but we know that there are some single level instructors here and there where people weren't interested. But we 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 don't quite know how to reach out and I think sometimes those instructors people also struggle to kind of connect. Uh, but we can take advantage and leverage the fact that we have these pockets of really well developed older instructors, experienced instructors, good instructors, and help those newcomers so people who are sort of you know alone as instructors in the institution. And I think Jack wants to see when, whenever he tries to match the instructor with workshops, you know, that he, he some some of those those single level instructors will really benefit from his mentor. So I wonder whether um, you know we can find a way of doing that. There's the international level, but there's, there might be also an African level that can get you in small scale. So I just wanted to put uh, the RSC campaign hat on for a second and, and say that uh, one of the things that I think is really important is that teaching is included in the role of the idea of what the sort of software engineers are doing for their, for their communities and their institutions. One of the reasons we haven't been able to skill as many uh, uh, postdoctoral PhD students in good software and research practices is because we haven't been able to scale the number of teachers as 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 one might. Um, and particularly for long and part of that is institutions haven't had people who want to teach this you know, because labor is rubbed in science quite recently. Um, so as we increase the number of people who are employed with RMCs, that will also unlock a, a bigger pool of people who can do the teaching in this. So I think that, that, that that's why it's important when we talk about the RSC campaign that it's not just about making code, it's also about building communities and teaching. Uh, and this suggests something that I don't remember that was mentioned is how to invite new members to our community. Do you have any tips on that? Because you go to our workshop, you have all these great students. Uh, I think it was Alexander that mentioned. If you have uh, advanced students, you can invite them to be a, a helper, but how to transform this helper to a member of our community? So, um, typically, it's sort of a three step process. The first engagement is you're in an institution that you like a workshop, and we help you, um, you know, through a jack of all. Find some instructors, get to a workshop happening at your institution. After that workshop, um, you know, I typically have a conversation with the host and say, okay, is this, you know, after one or two workshops, is this something that you'd like to build your own capacity so you can manage your own destiny in running workshops whenever you want to? Um, I think, you know, for example, Martin Callahan, I was just talking to this morning, and he said, we've reached the point where two PhD students decided to run their own workshop, and he's just smitten. He's not, not you know, in, involved in, in the process of setting that one up. And so that's what we mean about capacity building, is we continually um, train more and more instructors at your institution. There's a little bit of a financial commitment that comes with that in the sense that you're supporting software carpentry. We use those funds to support the organization, to support the curation of those highly impactful lessons. We also use some of that, that those funds to, to serve um, broader communities in um, underrepresented minorities in um, lower um, economic, you know, lower GDP countries, basically, and we, we use that support in order to build the community and in, 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 into a more diverse community. So that's kind of the first two steps. The third step can be, you know, and we have a couple of institutions that are doing this, that say every single PhD student that we have that has data-driven interests should go through the practice of becoming an instructor in this community. And um, what we do then is we train an instructor trainer. Um, in the case of Alexander, Alexander has kind of a, a, a national purview of an instructor trainer, and um, Stephen Crouch as well um, is an instructor trainer. And so we, we're, we're starting to build up that that's sort of that's a new level for us uh, in the last year or so, but we, we really are about you building your own capacity to manage your own destiny and plugging into the, the, the regional and international conversation about what you're trying, what's working, what's not working, how the lessons can be improved, um, what new lessons need to be developed um, in order to continue to make this community great. And 
that's the same with cross offer and data carpentry. Data carpentry goes more into discipline specific dives, and so there is, is um, a lot of um, need for lesson developers and people pointing to that kind of need. Um, in, yeah. yeah, I think that it's, um, I come back to what I said before, that's sort of some discussion maybe beyond this, um, this session. It's, uh, some, some of you and other um, uh, different representatives of organizations in the UK run a workshop, and I guess this is the thing. You find helpers, uh, Jack of the helps to map the instructors, to make the example of the instructor, make this one person. And then um, I have a feeling that a lot of, a lot of hosts, or some of the hosts, don't really know what, how to follow up. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I think we don't know whether it's not knowing whether you know don't, don't know how to follow up. Basically, you know, you happy with one workshop and then you're distracting from other responsibilities and you don't want to be involved in doing more training or helping with more training. So I think it would be great if um, uh, you have these concerns that, yeah, I run a workshop or I would like to run a workshop or I can get more engaged, I have these helpers and they're interested. I don't know what I can do beyond dropping an email to Jack and to add me in my UK um, mailbox. And I think that's yeah, that's that's something which I'd like to hear from you um, and SSI as well. Um, uh, that would be probably something we can discuss over uh, the, the, the the rest of the day. There, there is time that we can stay tomorrow if you want to have a chat about this, but also send me an email um, because I think that that is something which um, Bernier raised uh, that uh, we have. I find that we're trying to improve our process to help people get engaged and. Uh, Yes, you read it, you know, you're welcome to this community. But I don't know whether this is the problem. The problem is that, um, you know, we're resilient, they organize a workshop, but they just don't want to keep working with that. And so that's why there's no much for the law. Cheers. Going to add something? I suppose the only other thing I would say is um, you've got to keep filling the pipeline, and then it takes a while for people to move through and then, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, some of the senior EPCC at the Edinburgh Parliament Union said to people here, said to me a few years ago, was the their training stuff, their MSC, uh, their HPC MSC, is really good for then eventually people ending up as their as their as their as their um, staff members a few years later, right? Because you you basically got a cohort that you picked the best few in that. So the things all fit together, right? You have your software carpentry, you have your longer courses. People go through and finish their PhDs, and at the end of it, you know, you've been got a, a, a pipeline and then it's different. We just, we're in that transition phase now where software carpentry is maturing to the point where people are, are people who first did software carpentry at the beginning of their PhDs, and quite a lot of them are now ending and, 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 and that. So it's going to be, that's going to be an interesting transition, I think. Um, we are almost out of time, but uh, I want to open for less comments from Alexander. John and James, if they want. Okay, since I'm holding the mic, I'll jump. I just want to say that we're, like I said earlier, we're about capacity building and building um, communities, and that, as, as James says, is, is already evolving as you know, a lot of our community members are becoming themselves junior faculty members. And one of the really neat things about our community is what I see a lot in these, these collaborative workshops as well is that our community represents so many disciplines that the conversations that I see with a couple of faculty members um, you know, that are part of our community, um, there's Titus Brown, who's at UC Davis, talking to Ethan White, who's an ecologist, Titus is a biologist, talking to Matt Turk, who's an astrophysicist, all on one Twitter thread about lamenting the report writing they have to do in grants and things, but they're supporting each other as scholars and peers and friends, and it all comes from their interaction around teaching and teaching in impactful ways, and all of that, you know, um, you know, it, it's sort of, it's a great way to let your geek shine as, as you're, you know, excited about these tools and excited about what you're, you put into the doing your own science, and teaching it is one of the most exhilarating things Audience, um, and I encourage everyone of you who 
people are still peddling the, 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 the idea that teaching is a burden that researchers don't want to do. And that's a pernicious thing that's infected people's minds, I think, actually, because teaching is awesome fun. And, and I think we're seeing a bit of a, you know, that period when for a long time this, the, the leading top flight universities in, in the UK certainly were peddling some pretty darn awful teaching and some pretty darn awful teaching practices. Um, and I think we're seeing, we're seeing that changing now. I think we're seeing teaching becoming again a more respected part of what, of what, what goes on in universities. Perhaps it's because people are paying more for it than we used to, unfortunately. But anyway, for whatever reason, there seems to be a bit of rehabilitation of teaching in the world that we're having lately. Any other questions? So I, I want to say that apart from the fact that uh, um, as a side, of course, the administration is well, the operation side of the workshops, uh, we're very, um, we, we, we want also to also help try through thinking about competition training for uh, groups you're working with or your departments. Uh, we often get a request, oh, we'd like some coverage workshops because that's what people heard about. And then, you know, we're scrolling a bit more, uh, we realize that maybe later coverage will be more applicable, or maybe. You know, actually, the request as well. We we just need to do program week, and then we want to spend two more days working with that particular bit of software that is really useful in our domain. And uh, we're really, really still very happy to help guide you and maybe find other resources, maybe also connect with people who teach um, to get uh, some experiences when we're to part of this. Uh, so that means that you know, if we, if, if the realization is that oh. That is not really a soft coverage workshop, but at that point our role doesn't end. There's much more to it, and we're really, we're really happy to hear it. Uh, in particular, when it comes to training postdoctoral um, students, uh, sorry, doctoral students, uh, there is, I think, there is a, a wide range of needs that needs to be addressed, uh, and that will vary between disciplines, it will also vary between the, depending on the background of those students. So we, we also are there to support that and help with that. Uh, we won't be able to deliver every single training because we don't have the capacity for that as a society. But that is the point of growing a full of instructors in the UK. And as I said, we know that there are pockets of really big schools in the UK that are great. We just want to make sure that some places are connected and also that um, there's, a, there's a clear way of what's the follow up uh, once you started uh, engaging with the training community to carry on doing it. The other thing is it's interesting for you know, demand-driven uh, help is that there is the question of um, levels of experience in uh, reproducible competition research practices are so diverse and so, so some people are a long way up, some people are a long way down. There is a tendency of people to say, can you come and help me teach me how to better, make a better bow and arrow and then someone can buy you from the cannon. So um, there is, you know, so, so we do need to carry them. Some, some of the help is opinionated specifically for the reason that uh, of, the, of, of, of things like, you know, if you are uh, running your data pipeline by manually copying things from one Excel spreadsheet to another, you are doing it wrong, and we don't want to help you do that better, I think. Okay, so it's out of time. I uh, want to thank you, Alexander, John, and James, for the great talk, and hope you like some student teachers. And, uh, some applause for them. Thank you.